So welcome. Today we will be covering sprints 64, 65, and 66. Um, we're actually doing three sprints this review because of the face-to-face -face meeting in DC. We couldn't do our regular two sprint cadence, but we will go back to two sprints going forward. Uh, these are our team slides. We've got the same teams, but I did make a couple of updates here um, just to reflect uh, the focus of teams like Core Functional. Um, still focused on resource access, but we're also going to be focused on inventory um, this quarter as well as other core features. And then I also um, tweaked Vega and Concord because these are our other two core um, teams that are working on core features um, just to indicate that they are. Um, Vega is primarily focused on patron notices and staff slips, but they've got other core features on their plate as well. And Concord um, is a new team and we have a backlog in place for them for Q3, which includes anonymizing loans, um, circ rules, and um, some other core features. And then we've got all the team members for each of the teams. And I think we did have one new team member here on Thunderjet. Yuri Anescu um, is a new developer on Thunderjet. So welcome, Yuri. <clears throat> and lots. Oh, and I guess I should say that Concord is fully formed. And um, because Concord is going to have you know, several POs feeding their backlog. Um, they have a PO lead and that's Emma Betcher. So Emma will be sort of leading the POs, making sure that she understands the priority of the backlog across the different areas. Um, so we're happy to have Emma in that role. <clears throat> All right, and to talk about releases, I will hand it over to Jakob. Thanks, Kate. Hello, everyone. Um, I'll just give a quick update about the, uh, the Clover release uh, uh, that got out on Monday, well, it was finalized on Monday, uh, July the 1st, according to schedule. So kudos to everybody who's been involved in making this release happen, all the module developers and, and, and lead maintainers uh, that made sure that the releases were on time. It's really appreciated. Um, so the Clover uh, uh, reference environment is available at the uh, provided link, the one in the, in the, in the slides. Uh, some statistics about the release. There's, there's been 95 functional features planned and 81 delivered. Uh, the bug trash, trash process was, um, uh, trash process was uh, successful for this release. Uh, all the bugs uh, labeled with, uh, with, uh, with the Q2 2019, uh, label have been addressed. Uh, there's been a couple of uh, uh, bug fix module releases uh, uh, delivered after the, the initial module release timeline uh, the deadline, uh, and those uh, those module releases bug fixes have been incorporated into the Clover release branch. Uh, there's a dashboard available with details on and the feature breakdown, and the release notes and, and release statistics are coming soon. Uh, Kate, would you mind switching? Yeah, thank you. Uh, the plan for the mid-quarter or the, the Q3.1 release is as follows. Uh, the module release deadline is planned for July 24th. Uh, uh, and, uh, and this is one of the most, more, most important deadlines for this release plan. So uh, a, uh, um, a call out to all the module developers and lead maintainers to make sure that the module uh, releases are ready uh, before that deadline. Uh, um, not having those releases in place will uh, put the entire timeline at risk. So, uh, so please make sure that those module releases are ready. Uh, after the, the module release deadline, there will be uh, literally a couple of days to, us, uh, to incorporate all the all the module releases into a release uh, branch and a release environment, uh, and we will follow with a uh, bug fest, uh, so manual testing of the uh, of the of the release of the entire folio release, and that's going to happen um, the following week, so the week of the July 29th. Um, 
there is another deadline which uh, which will uh, I'd like to you know uh, turn your attention to. We're sort of explicitly mentioning it this time uh, uh, because it was not clear. Uh, from the uh, Q2 release timeline uh, that, uh, that this deadline uh, needs to be followed. That's the deadline for the bug fix releases. So any modules that require bug fixes uh, for bugs that has been triaged during, during the, uh, the, 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 the release triage, bug triage process uh, must be released uh, before August 8th. So there is not a whole lot of time. It is actually only a couple of days after the, the bug festival concludes, uh, but the, the, the bug trash team will actually be triaging those bugs uh, uh, on a daily basis. So as they come in, as they are reported, they will be triaged. So, so the teams will be aware of those bugs uh, immediately, almost. Uh, but that sprint that follows the, uh, the module release deadline will be essential in making sure that the, the bugs are fixed and that the module releases are provided. So again, uh, please make sure that those, uh, this deadline is met and that bug fix is ready uh, uh, before that deadline. And then if uh, assuming all uh, goes well and uh, all the bugs are fixed, uh, the Q3.1 release will become public on the August 12th. Uh, so uh, that's Monday, the following Monday. Kato, would you mind switching to the next slide? Sure. Yeah, so uh, as you can see from the way this is aligned on the calendar, there's not a whole lot of time uh, for, this, uh, for this release. The, the, the first deadline, the module release deadline is coming up pretty soon. So that's the 24th of July. Uh, so please keep that in mind. Uh, then the bug fix will take place immediately after and we will have the, uh, the module release, uh, the bug fix release deadline on the uh, 8th of August, only one day to confirm that everything is in place and, and then go live with the, uh, with the Q3.1 release. Uh, that's all I have in terms of release planning. If you guys have any questions, uh, don't hesitate to ask me on Slack. Um, uh, I'll be happy to help you out. And of course, as always, we have a release uh, channel where we'll be coordinating this and, 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 and next releases. Thanks. Thank you, Jakob. All right, uh, definition of done hasn't changed. So I'm gonna skim over that. And then as always, we have the highlights from each team since we're not able to show everything. If you wanna know what the teams have been focused on, you can come in here and there are highlights and links to JIRA um, for the full list of issues. And that brings us to demos. Uh, it looks like we've got several teams presenting, starting with Thunderjet. Uh, Lexi, um, are you ready? Uh, I don't know if I said your name right. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's pretty, pretty close. Uh, Dennis here. I'm just going to say a couple of quick things before we get into it. Um, just the first thing is regarding sort of acquisition development in general. Um, the Thunderjet team has built some really great momentum in the last number of weeks. This is covering um, you know, quite a few weeks. And so we've done our best to sort of, in the interest of time, narrow things down in, uh, to a small set of changes that affect a few, I guess what we would consider exciting areas. Um, but the upcoming release is really gonna be packed full of, of refinements and functionality. So. Um, you're going to get a little snapshot here of some of the big things happening with orders um, and, spoiler alert, some of the things happening with invoicing. And just want to say a big thanks to everybody on the Thunderjet team and the folks who've been helping us out with different things because uh, it's been a very productive number of weeks. So with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to Lexi and we'll get into some details. Awesome. Oh, let me stop sharing. Hi guys, uh, so I'm going to show you some features on for the snapshot environment. Uh, first of all, uh, I'm going to show you a linkage to the instance module from orders. So we go to the orders list. Uh, we have a couple orders here. And uh, if 
in uh, purchase order line uh, in item details we selected uh, some item uh, that existed exists in the instance module it will be displayed as a link to instance so user can click and uh, details of that instance shown on the screen he can proceed to edit uh, of that instance uh, or do some other stuff or go back to the key line details uh, if uh, there is no such uh, linkage by UID in purchase order line, it's well, uh, maybe it was entered by a uh, user manually, so uh, it will display just title as regular text. Um, next uh, thing I can show you uh, this. Uh, disabled fields uh, we disabled fields depending on order st status if it's open uh, you will not see um, important fields to be enabled for editing like a number vendor order type is dis disabled however you can add some notes uh, just to that will not destroy your order uh, the same for pure line. If order is an open status, uh, some important field like uh, a linkage to the instance, uh, subscription uh, information, pure line details, uh, some important fields are disabled. Okay, uh, the next uh, feature is um, uh, I believe a search and filter. We have a lot. Uh, we embedded a lot of uh, filters uh, for orders uh, like uh, vendor. Uh, it's a selectable list, so you can uh, filter it and uh, observe filtered list as well um, as well as uh, some additional data range filters like for renewal date it's for ongoing orders um, I think I've created some uh, order with the renewal date for tomorrow yep that's it um, so, and uh, a lot of filters for uh, PO line, also including some data range. Uh, let's check for today's PO lines. Uh, a lot of other filters. And you'll notice that when you land here in orders, there are some that are preset. So this sort of landing page has been configured to have a certain uh, configuration of filters checked to begin with. But of course, you can always reset. Um, right. So uh, by default, the selected receipt status, payment status for order lines. To see, I believe, uh, actual lines to work with, uh, as well as for orders, it's just default filter by status for open and pending orders. Uh, thank you, Dennis. Uh, and uh, we implemented some part of for order templates. Uh, it's under uh, orders uh, setting and order templates. I've created some, uh, we can create new. Uh, it contains some uh, information regarding template, code, name, uh, description, and uh, 
blocks uh, required for creating order and the PO lines. So basically it's the same uh, from other forms uh, as well as title. It could be selected as, as instance. Yeah, uh, some position method order format. It's all uh, the same from as for PLN. So just a quick thing to note here while Lexi's finishing building this off um, is that you do see some the some of the red stars that might indicate required fields, but there for a purchase order template there won't be any required fields. Um, that's actually being implemented right now. Um, just removing those validation and requirements from the actual template form so that it can be populated with pretty much anything. And then once you select it, when you're actually building an order, um, the data is sort of validated at, at that stage of the process. So um, you'll have freedom to really create whatever template you're, you're choosing to create. Right, it's in progress in current sprint. So uh, maybe we'll demonstrate the whole flow on the next uh, demo. Uh, since we have also ticket to use it, this on use such templates on create order and create the line screen. Uh, so we can edit uh, uh, templates and uh, actually delete them. Uh, I believe uh, there will be a check to not delete template if any order created by this by using this. But right now it's there's no orders created using templates. Uh, I think I'm done uh, with my part. Uh, thank you. If you have any questions, please ask. Thanks, this looks amazing. I did no, notice a few things like with the disabled fields, it made me think of um, the request record where we also have a bunch of fields disabled up on edit and we're handling the UI a little differently. So I don't, it doesn't look like a disabled um, you know, form field, it's just text. So we should probably sync up with the UX mm -hmm. folks and see what they, what direction they wanna head so that we're consistent. Um, and I also noted you guys have a ton of filters. It's amazing. Did have you had this many, or is this are most of these new? Most of these so, were added in the last three sprints, right, Dennis? Yes, and it's all sort of based on analysis that we've done, obviously, with the small group, uh, just in looking at the order form and what people would like to either search or filter by. So we've, huh. we've now been able to implement all of those. Wow, it looks uh, really powerful. Desire, yeah. Kate, the inventory, um, we're in the process of building, um, restricting the editing of fields if they're co controlled by an underlying mark. So if we're going to strive for a consistent UI for that, then then that's going to, we'll want to follow that too. So, oh, yeah. Okay. Um, so just let us know if we get to uh, a agreement on what that should look like. All right. Mm -hmm. I'll start the conversation after this with the UX folks. Um, the other thing is also the templates is really amazing. And I know Charlotte had wanted to do something similar for um, inventory. So it's really cool that you guys are sort of paving the way. Maybe there's something there that we can borrow, or at least a model we can use for inventory if it meets the requirements there. Mm -hmm. Sounds promising. Yeah, it looks really cool. Those you. are all my thoughts. So I think we can pass the word to Nikita. Nikita. Yeah. Thank you.
So Makita, if you're on mute, just make a quick note. <laughs> yeah, he's uh, struggling with audio issues, but I believe he should resolve this. This is all the part of building the suspense. <laughs> <laughs> or we can circle back. If yeah, we, we can circle back. Okay. Uh, is, he, is he coming through? Uh, anyway. It looked like he was talking. That sounded promising. Yes? Yeah, do you hear me? Yeah. yeah, there you go. Cool. Uh, something wrong with my earphones. Uh, okay, let me share my screen. So this one. Let me know if you see it. Yeah, looks good. Yeah. Okay. So I'd like to present to you our new module invoice. Uh, so at this moment we have like base list uh, of invoices. Uh, for now, without uh, searching filter support, uh, but uh, we have, we support all CRUD operations for invoice and invoice lines. So let me present how we can create invoice. Uh, I just fill all required fields. Mm. and payment method. So you can see that uh, invoice has been created and uh, mm -hmm. you see details view, plus uh, it's displayed in invoice uh, list. So this view is not fully completed. We need to add more accordions, but for now it just uh, displays uh, basic information about invoice. Uh, plus we can edit uh, mm -hmm. invoice, yeah. just for example, invoice date. Uh, and you see it has been changed uh, it, uh, and we can remove it, but uh, I'll do the section uh, at the end of the demo. So uh, additionally, we support creation and uh, uh, like CRUD operation for invoice lines. There are two ways to uh, create them to invoice. Uh, one of them is add action and another one is new. Uh, let's use new for, for now. Uh, sorry, uh, let me <laughs> refresh the page. So yeah, new action and uh, we have a uh, new form for invoice lines. We are going to turn on this text file, yeah? To select it to... Uh, and I think that's it with required fields. And uh, you see it uh, has been created and uh, appears uh, in list of uh, invoice lines in uh, invoice details plus uh, subtotal value uh, has been recalculated. Uh, another way to uh, create lines uh, is at action mm -hmm. and we can create them based on uh, pure lines. So we, we implemented plugin with uh, mostly the same uh, list uh, Alexei um, demonstrated before the same set of filters and mostly the same columns. So let's uh, create two lines. Uh, and yeah, they uh, have been added. And again, total value uh, uh, has been recalculated. Um, so user can uh, view details of this line. Uh, again, uh, the same as we have for invoice, it's like base view and uh, we'll improve it. Uh, 
invoice line can be edited. Let's change mm -hmm. subtotal value. And uh, total value of invoice uh, has been recalculated mm -hmm. again. Yeah. And uh, we can remove. So that's me with invoices. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Do you have any questions? The web is, for example, 700 or two. This is you. also new. <laughs> Sorry, this uh, is new as well, right? Yeah, this is this is a the first showing of the invoice module. So Amazing. this is a brand new module from the suite of acquisitions. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, you guys have made a ton of progress. This looks great. Awesome. And obviously, there's there's more coming here, but uh, we're seeing it in snapshot, and so there'll be a an acceptance testing running for for this invoicing module shortly. Cool. Well, thank you. Okay, so I have next on the list uh, Spitfire. Looks like Yuri is going first. Yeah, hi all. Um, so uh, I'm going to present to you uh, a new feature which is called uh, not. Uh, Notes are designed to record uh, vendor staff and uh, pattern correspondence. <clears throat> and uh, the main goal is uh, uh, to give uh, a possibility for administrator uh, to track uh, the communications uh, with the uh, library staff, uh, vendors, uh, students, and etc. Uh, so here uh, I will demonstrate to you uh, Notes uh, in scope of uh, eHoldings application, but this feature can be easily applied uh, to uh, any UI module. So uh, let's start uh, and uh, let's try to create a node. Uh, so here you can see in provider section uh, a notes accordion with a uh, uh, list of nodes. So for now, it is only one node which is assigned uh, to this record. But we can create another one. So here, here you can see a creation page. Uh, uh, to create node, uh, we need uh, a node type uh, which is uh, uh, created. Uh, also, you can uh, create another one type uh, from uh, uh, the settings section. Here you can see in sections we, all, uh, we also added uh, nodes. Uh, here you can see high priority node type uh, and we can create uh, another one type. Uh, also a small node type uh, uh, is uh, unique uh, so we can't uh, add uh, uh, as a type with the same uh, name, you can see an error and uh, the button is disabled. So let's go back to our create page. Let's refresh it. It took a while to refresh. Okay, let's try it uh, from uh, is this. Let's try again to create. Here you can see as yeah, the node type uh, is added, load type. Here we can type, uh, it is required uh, field uh, for uh, the node title. Uh, can type some kind of feed and we can uh, add the details so uh, 
for example, for example, something like this. Uh, this section is pretty the same as we have in our application uh, uh, with with week. Uh, um, so uh, we can uh, add the text, we can make it bold, uh, we can change uh, the style to heading and so on. But uh, let's do it. Let's keep it normal. Uh, also, uh, there is uh, uh, one restriction like uh, not always uh, should be assigned uh, to one record. For example, uh, uh, here you can see that it is uh, assigned to provider and we cannot assign uh, uh, record uh, if, if you have only one, uh, uh, if we assign not only to one record, we cannot assign it because uh, not cannot live without uh, any records. Okay, uh, let's save our note. Here you can see a newly created node. We can go uh, to node details page. Uh, here you can see uh, all uh, data which we created. And uh, here is a um, uh, section with metadata. Also, we can edit uh, the node. And you can see that the last updated data uh, uh, is uh, different uh, from uh, the created data. Also, we have uh, uh, new words uh, in details. Okay, also we can uh, delete node. And we have uh, a notification uh, that uh, this node uh, will be deleted uh, from uh, uh, the records uh, which uh, it is assigned. For now, it is assigned only to uh, one provider record. You can delete it. Here you can see only one assigned node. Uh, also, what I want to show you is uh, assign and unassign functionality. So this model is responsible uh, for uh, uh, assigning and assigning of the nodes uh, to the record. Uh, so here you can we can uh, uh, filter like search as uh, nodes uh, which is assigned and which is not assigned. Here we can see another one uh, assigned to package. Uh, let's assign it. Here you can see it. So one node uh, can be assigned uh, to uh, different uh, uh, records. In the holdings, uh, we can assign nodes uh, to providers, packages, and to resources. Uh, also, uh, we uh, developed, we added uh, permissions. Uh, uh, like to add uh, or to allow or disallow uh, doing uh, uh, like uh, assign and assign functionality, uh, view nodes uh, and so on. So let's try uh, one of the uh, permissions, for example, uh, permission to edit uh, the node. Uh, so, uh, uh, Please pay attention that for now we have a uh, edit button and it is uh, allowed uh, to edit uh, the node. But uh, we can go uh, to users. Uh, now uh, I'm, uh, I have selected uh, an, it is an administrator user uh, uh, and I'm going to delete uh, the permission for editing the node. Let's go to permissions. Mm. Here it is. So let's go back. Try to 
refresh. Okay, one second, need to copy uh, the URL uh, to check the permission. For now, the permission is not applied. I just need uh, to uh, relogin to application. So let's do it. Oops. Let's go to providers again. Let's go to the node. And here you can see that there is no edit button. Also, uh, uh, it is not allowed uh, to go uh, by uh, uh, the URL. Let's try it to edit the node. The user should be redirected to the home page. Yeah, here we are. Uh, so I think that's pretty it. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact me. Thank you. That was awesome, Yuri. Thank you. Um, I saw Kalila demo this feature to the RA SIG recently, and um, it, we definitely want to try to use it uh, for staff notes on requests as well. So I think we'll see this feature and many other apps. So it, is this set up to where it can be used across a lot of different apps at this point? Yeah, so for now we are using it in the holdings and I believe our uh, team uh, integrated it into agreements application. Okay, perfect. Yeah, um, Yuri's right. And not only agreements and licenses as well, licenses is also using notes too. Okay, thank you, Khalilo. Cool. Uh, looks like Carol was also going to demo from Spitfire. Yes. Hi, all. Um, let me share my screen. Um, let me see my desktop. Um, okay. Can you all see my screen? Not yet. Okay. How about yes. now? Yep. Okay. Okay, so I am going to be demonstrating uh, searching by tags fun functionality that the uh, Spitfire team has been working on uh, past few sprints. Um, so the filter by tags functionality is now available for providers, packages, and resources. And also you can filter by tags when you're searching within a package or a provider. So um, earlier on, I did add some tags, but I will add a, one just to go through the, um, here I'm just gonna add a tag renewal to this, um, this provider. And so if I go back in and I do a filter by tags for renewal, I'll see all of the different providers which have been tagged that way. We can also um, filter multiple tags. So important, I happen to had, had um, um, tagged Gale as important. Um, so similarly as to providers, we can do the filtering within packages. Um, again, these have all been tagged with renewal. Um, for titles, we are actually um, tagging resources. So if I were to go in here and I, I tag some earlier, so if I go into this particular title, um, it's the title, uh, it's the resource that's actually been uh, tagged with renewal and we're doing this filtering searching on uh, this tag as well. So as I had mentioned earlier, um, for providers, we can go in and search for a particular provider. For example, I'm gonna search for, let me see, um, actually academic, um, actually for Gale. So within Gale, within our um, search within, we've added the tag filter and again, we can search for um, packages within Gale, which have been tagged. Um, similar functionality for um, resources within a package. So I had um, within academic ASAP, I had 
tagged some resources. Um, so if we go in within our filter within, um, we have added this tag filter. Um, and one of the resources which I had previously tagged for renewal is can be uh, searched for um, using the tags filter. Um, so this was um, a lot of work from the back end team and I'm fortunate to be able to demo it, but lots of good work from the Spitfire team. So that's it for me. I don't know if there's any questions. This is really awesome. <laughs> Can this or will this be used elsewhere in Folio as well? Yes, I believe uh, Agreements has filter by tags, um, okay. and I'm not sure. There, I'm, I'm sure there's other apps that will be adding it. I think users and um, some other ones as well. Yes. Awesome. Yes, yes, yes. And this is a piece of the basic tags functionality that that was intended to be. Uh, it's kind of the whole reason we have tags is so that you can filter by them and gather records that have the same tag. So. Um, so it's great to see it starting to come to life and then be able to be used by other apps. So thank you for bringing it to life. Yeah, I agree. Thank you. We'll definitely want to use it in requests and users as well. Very cool. Um, okay, so next up, and we've got to move along fairly quickly now because we still have five groups that want to demo. Um, so FullyJet is next. And Anne-Marie, you were going to start, up, start them off? Yes, so very quickly, we've got three. Um, Kate Sanchenko, one of our uh, uh, backend developers, has done some analysis and performance testing for data import and source record storage. So she'll show that flow and the results of that. Um, Sasha Yohorov is going to show a quick summary of the work we've done on action profiles. And Taras Tachenko will show a bit more of the integration between source record storage and inventory and some updates to the import log. So Kate. Hello everyone. Uh, just give me a second to share my screen. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, yes. we can see it. Okay, so uh, I would like to share the results of data import performance testing. Uh, but before I scroll down to the actual results, uh, let's just take a quick look at the data import process itself. Uh, it is shown on this diagram and uh, the data import processing is triggered by uh, pressing the uh, button on UI, which says load more bibliographic records. And it starts um, breaking the file into chunks on the back end. And uh, those chunks are then sent to Mozart Circuit Manager uh, for parsing and uh, saved to Mozart Circuit Storage. Uh, after that, um, source records are mapped to inventory instances and saved in mod inventory. Uh, and uh, as the last stage of the processing for now, um, source records are updated, uh, set in the instance ID. Uh, so this happens for every chunk and uh, uh, the processing of the file is considered finished when uh, each chunk from this file is processed in this manner. And on UI, uh, we can observe uh, those processed files uh, in the logs uh, section of data import. So uh, for the testing itself, uh, we used two files. Uh, one of them is dot um, .mrc um, file, which contains uh, 30,000 of raw marked bibliographic records. And another one is JSON file, which contains uh, about 28,000 of uh, marked records in JSON format. Um, the testing itself um, was uh, performed on a Folio snapshot load environment. And uh, uh, it takes about eight minutes to load each of these files, uh, which makes about 17 seconds to load 100 records. Uh, oh, sorry, 1,000. Mm. 
Uh, we also tested uh, data input performance locally. Uh, the results were a bit worse uh, because uh, my local machine has uh, less computing power than uh, AWS environment. Uh, but uh, uh, we could play with uh, different parameters like chunk size and the number of uh, chunks that can be uh, processed simultaneously. By default, uh, those numbers are 50 records and uh, uh, 10 chunks at, at one time. And uh, the results are as follows. Uh, it takes 25 seconds uh, to load uh, 1,000 of raw mark records and 22 seconds to load 1,000 of JSON records. Uh, so those are the results. Uh, I would also like to say that uh, we tested uh, the data import performance along the uh, different stages of implementing it and the results before were not that good. Mm, we had to take a few steps to improve the performance and so far um, the best results we can get um, um, as a result of moving towards the uh, batch update and save operations. Uh, since it uh, significantly decreases uh, the number of HTTP calls uh, that are moving between the uh, modules, uh, the whole process of data import uh, speeds, out, uh, speeds up. Um, and uh, I believe that it's, uh, this is our best shot uh, until we implement the event-driven approach. Uh, you can follow the uh, links to Jira tickets and uh, learn more about the progress on this um, job. So um, that's, that's all that I wanted to share. Uh, I think I will um, send the link to this uh, page in the group chat as well. And whoever's interested can take a look at this and please contact me if you have any questions. Great. Thank you, Kate. Thank it looks you. like Sasha is next. Yes. Hello. So guys, please let me know when you can see my screen. You can see it. Nice. Um, so we are now on uh, data import session page on action profiles tab. And that's what I want to demonstrate to you today. So action profiles are actually pretty similar to match profiles and uh, job profiles. It has a name column, text column, updated, updated by. However, it has uh, some uh, different uh, differences uh, uh, from other profiles. Uh, as you can see, it has action column, which uh, consists of uh, the action itself and the follow record type. For example, in that case, it, the action is create and the record type is mark authority. And uh, it has uh, corresponding icons uh, for mark authority this one and uh, plus sign for create, for example, and uh, different icons for different actions. Um, the next column is mapping. It is empty for now for some technical reasons, but once it will be coming from backend, uh, it uh, will be displayed on UI side. Uh, and uh, it is just uh, associated mapping uh, profile name with mapping profile icon. Mm. All of uh, uh, the columns are sortable. I'm sorry, yes, sortable. And uh, we have search as well with highlighting and uh, text. Mm. So for 
each action profile, we can see its details uh, with some more information with all different kinds of accordions. Uh, it has a default summary with description and uh, updated information. Uh, details accordion is empty for now. It will be developed in future. Uh, associated field mapping profile uh, has uh, a field mapping profile associated with action profile and uh, it is always one or zero. Uh, and uh, associated job profiles can have more. Let me find uh, an example. So it uh, just shows all the associated job profiles and it has checkboxes. Uh, and for now, editing or something else uh, or duplicate and deleting is not implemented, but we have ability to create new profiles. Uh, let me demonstrate. Those accordions are empty for now. It's uh, plans for future. And when we create a new one, uh, it is instantly demonstrated on uh, details pane. As you can see for now, it, ha it doesn't have a field mapping profile or job profiles associated with it. So I believe that's it. Uh, thank you. If you have any questions, feel free to ask. Thank you. I'm gonna move us on to Taras because we are running out of time. Taras, are you ready? Yeah, sure. Uh, okay, guys, uh, please let me know when you can start to see my screen. You can see it. Okay, so um, some of the parts of my uh, first uh, pre presented feature uh, is not uh, on the environment now, so I will show it on my local machine. Uh, this uh, presentation is uh, dedicated to this part of presentation is dedicated to reviving the view source button for uh, uh, the instance uh, instances in inventory module that uh, are created based on uh, mark underlying mark records so um, first of all um, I will show you the record, the instance uh, which is not created by the underlying mark record. As you can see, the, it has only edit and duplicate uh, options in action menu and doesn't have another one is, um, another one is the uh, record uh, which has actually, uh, um, underlying mark record, but it is not uh, uh, it is not present, it is lost somehow. So you can uh, see that um, system shows that uh, the record, underlying mark record should be, but it doesn't. And this uh, view source button is blocked. Um, and now I will show you the uh, normal uh, instance which uh, underlined mark record is, is present. Let me re reload the page. Okay. Yeah, we have the view source. It is not the quick. Okay, we can switch to this one. Yeah, as, as you all can see, uh, we see the uh, underlying mark records uh, presentation for the uh, instance, we uh, we know that underlying mark record exists. Uh, another one feature I will uh, show you uh, is the 
log viewer component uh, which uh, allows uh, our um, data data import job logs uh, to be shown in convenient way um, let's uh, presume we have the small file um, which uh, for sure has uh, uh, error records and success records so uh, we click uh, on view log button and we will see this component. Yeah, sure. And we can see the component that shows the records number, uh, errors number, um, records uh, that um, have errors are uh, highlighted by a special way. Um, this component um, uh, is based on a completely new um, scratch, scratch build uh, code highlight feature uh, that is now a property of Folio uh, and has no license dependencies. Um, each uh, log entry um, renders in separate code highlight block. Uh, you can easily see them. Uh, you can filter them. Uh, for example, we can view just successful or info records. Uh, errors only and all of them um, and uh, you can easily change the uh, code highlighting theme from light to dark so uh, this component is uh, fully modular um, uh, it uh, is actually ready to be contributed to stripes and used if anyone will be uh, interested in it uh, it has completely modular and independent code highlight component which has uh, uh, simple language definition files to define and add uh, languages into it. And now uh, uh, only JSON highlighting is uh, defined. So uh, also um, it has a mechanism to create uh, modular th themes that support our modular CSS approach. Um, we have uh, some short roadmap for it. Um, uh, for example, the first uh, task will be uh, uh, creating the log pagination or infinite scroll to uh, tackle out uh, uh, huge logs, uh, which uh, cannot be loaded uh, just in one page. Uh, also uh, in the roadmap is the gutter column to show line numbers and line marks. And uh, also uh, we have the, uh, the wish to implement uh, MRC file or mark record uh, highlighting uh, language definition. So um, uh, also it uh, supports uh, external um, error detector function, which can be uh, defined and uh, put uh, to this log viewer as a prop from the parent component because uh, log viewer will not recognize, uh, will uh, uh, log entry contain error or not so it is it should be defined by the um, color component so um, that's basically all uh, if you um, if you have any questions or interested in some features you can contact me and thank you Taras this looks really cool I'm interested to hear from the developers if there are other places where we could use that um, cool new feature log feature um, but I'm going to move us on to Vega now. Um, and it looks like Alexander is first for Vega. Uh, yep. Hi, everyone. Let me know when you can see my screen. Not yet. Yes. Okay. I want to start from a UI calendar module, especially from permissions because uh, we have reworked them recently. Currently, we have three permissions. It's for view, uh, calendar events, edit calendar events, and, uh, and delete calendar events. And uh, I have created three different users with different permissions. And uh, let's check out uh, UI changes. Uh, first of all, uh, test user which can only view uh, periods, can he can add a new period. You can see it right here. Because uh, uh, user which can 
add and delete periods, can press this button. Also, uh, user test user which can uh, view periods just can see uh, details about this one, uh, this event, and other users can uh, uh, make changes and save or delete uh, the these events. Basically, the same uh, flow we have for um, uh, exceptional periods. It's pretty the same one. So users uh, with uh, full permissions uh, can add delete uh, uh, periods and uh, user which uh, just can view, it, view them can do nothing. Just view the detailed information. Okay, uh, let's proceed with whole shelf clearance report. So for this, uh, let's go to the request uh, module. Currently, we have uh, there are no items uh, which can be used to generate error, uh, this uh, report. So we have this uh, message. And uh, let's create um, um, this report. So first of uh, first of all, let's check out an item uh, to a user. Okay. Okay. Then let's create a request. And check some random requester. Okay, after that, let's uh, check in an item and it will have a uh, status waiting for, keep up, uh, for pickup. Also, uh, right now, let's cancel the request. And now we can get the uh, hold shelf clearance report. Okay. This is all information what we needed. Um, probably that's all from my side. Thank you for your attention. Attention. If you have any questions, please contact me, uh, and probably I will stop sharing my screen. Thanks, Alexander. That report looks great. I've been testing it, and just um, for those and who are watching, it it doesn't only. Uh, show the items that are canceled while awaiting pickup, but also those that expire. Um, yeah, you're right. So, you. Yeah. Um, okay, so next up from Vega is, oops, um, Dimitro. Yeah, sure. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, today, I'm going to introduce you the functionality of uh, time-based notices for uh, loans. Uh, unlike uh, user-initiated uh, notices, uh, for user-initiated uh, notices, the, tri the trigger for um, time-based ones is the point, uh, a specific point in time. Uh, for example, for loans is a uh, loan due date. So first, uh, let me show you how this uh, notices can be configured. Uh, the configuration for them is placed in uh, pattern notice policy. And here I have an example. Um, first notice is um, is for checkout event. It's a user initiated uh, event uh, notice and it has only a few options. You can select a template and a format. 
but when you select uh, low on due date uh, event, you can uh, choose more. For example, you can send the event before um, before due date, uh, after due date, or upon due date. You can also set up a notice to be recurring and a recurring period for, for it. Uh, so here I have uh, prepared a uh, setup uh, uh, where, which uh, sends uh, an accordance notice uh, 15, minutes, 15 minutes before and then every five minutes just until a due date. Then a one-time due date notice upon a due date. Uh, first, over the, first over the notice also one time 10 minutes after and then the last uh, second uh, over the notice that is uh, sent, for the first notice is sent uh, after 30 minutes and then uh, every five minutes. Uh, it's really hard to show it on live demo and, uh, and now I'm going to demonstrate uh, my inbox. Uh, to show how it happened in the past today. So uh, please look that uh, I checked out the item at 4.40. Uh, then I started um, getting a uh, courtesy notice every five minutes just until it, the due date. Uh, after 10 minutes after due date, it was the first over due notice that is not recurring. And the third, 30 minutes after due date, I get over due note, recurring over due notice that happens every five minutes. Um, uh, so recurring over due notice will be sent until uh, item is checked in. So as you can see, the last email is checked in, checked in received. So seems like that's all from my side. Please ask questions if you have. Uh, what kind of triggers are there to set this off? Is it is just the one implemented right now, um, the, uh, the due date? Yep, it's a okay. due date for loan. Okay. Wow, that's really cool to see. Yeah. That's huge. Okay. Um, cool. Thank you, Dimitro. And Ola is next. Hi, everyone. Um, uh, I'm going to show you uh, how the tokens uh, work in the Folio system. Um, uh, the token is a uh, kind of placeholder which is uh, used in a pattern notice template. Uh, let's uh, go to the template editor. Mm. Uh, to see the list of available uh, tokens, uh, you need to click uh, this button and there is a list uh, of available tokens. And um, uh, we can choose some tokens, uh, add them, uh, and uh, the system will replace the tokens with uh, corresponding values uh, before sending a notice. Um, I have prepared uh, a couple of uh, templates uh, to show that request related and uh, uh, loan related uh, notice are sent. It is uh, a check, check out template. Uh, and uh, we see the list of tokens here um, and uh, request cancellation template. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, let's try to create a request and then cancel it uh, to see the tokens in the email. So the request is created and now I'm going to cancel it. Uh, let's enter some information about request cancellation. 
and then I'm expecting to get a notice. Uh, I got a request cancellation notice uh, and uh, uh, as you can see, uh, the tokens is responding by the values. So there is request related uh, tokens and item related and user related tokens. And uh, let's try to perform the checkout. And uh, now I got a checkout notice uh, with list of tokens. Uh, that's all I wanted to show. Thank you for the attention. If you have any kind of questions, feel free to ask. Wow, Ola, that's really cool. That's a lot of tokens. It's really impressive. Um, great. Okay, it looks like that was it for Vega, which means we can move on to Concord and Victor will be doing the demo. Hi, yep. Uh, let me share my screen. Uh, uh, do you see it? Yes. Great. So uh, this is our, uh, as you can say, this is our first uh, sprint review and we're glad to be here. Um, during uh, uh, that we worked on different kind of uh, task issues uh, and as you can see we worked on bug fixes and improvements to circulation rules, editor, uh, validation issues, translation issues, uh, etc. And uh, as well we incorporated several new features uh, which I'm gonna uh, demo right now. And the first of them is uh, uh, making uh, inventory application to not show uh, search any uh, items um, by default, uh, which is similar to how UI users application behaves. So in order to see some results, we need to uh, hit uh, search yeah, or whether or hit uh, some uh, filters. For example, this one provocations. So uh, this is one of the features which we delivered and the next one is uh, overdue once report where we have added uh, several new fields including uh, borrower information this is uh, borrower name borrower barcode and borrower id and uh, also we added uh, one policy field and uh, one policy id field id field this uh, feature and the, and request feature which is uh, as similar to what I showed right now, is also concerned about uh, report stuff. And uh, in order to see requests, uh, we need to select something and hit export to CSV. And here we added uh, library and uh, show and location code uh, fields. This stuff required a lot of uh, backend work and uh, additional thanks uh, to Mark Johnson for reviewing stuff uh, from the backend side. And uh, the last one is uh, um, providing uh, information for uh, uh, requester uh, request information during check-in. And for that purpose, let me copy uh, some information for the pattern and enter it. And here you can see that we can uh, now see open requests uh, a feature which uh, points to the amount of open requests for this button and uh, uh, we can navigate uh, to the request page from it and this is uh, basically uh, all what i wanted to show thank you thank you victor nice job thanks victor looks great thank you Okay, and that brings us to core functional. Zach was gonna do a short demo. Um, we have been doing a lot of work on SIP2 and title level requests, which we're not gonna be able to show. And that's where most of our backend development um, has been focused. Uh, so we've got one backend developer um, who's helping um, you know, move along other features. It just makes it a little slower going. Um, and our front end developers are knocking out bugs like crazy. Um, as well as new features. So um, we have just a few things to show. And with that, I'll turn it over to Zach. And I keep sharing the wrong screen. <laughs> well, I think we see the right one. 
No, this is, you're seeing GitHub, right? No, we're seeing users. Oh, you're seeing users. Okay, it's just highlighting the wrong thing. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I will run then, perfect. Um, so as Kate said, we've been doing lots of bug fixes and general improvements and stuff behind the scenes. Uh, a lot of work from people who are not me, but I happen to be demoing stuff today. Um, in the past, there's been lots of problems with you know, long lists of locations or service points or contributor types or any kind of lookup table. A lot of that stuff has been resolved. I'm not going to demo bug, bug fixes, though. It's mostly new stuff. Um, one of the new things in search for users, um, this is now term-based rather than phrase-based. So it used to be that if you had you know, a user like Chet Koss, uh, and you wanted to try and find him and you clicked search, you wouldn't get anything because it was looking for the single phrase check costs as one kind of big string. Um, now we're breaking this up and searching for things individually. Um, so if you had say uh, Bill Koss, you can see, I think Bill is, what do I want it to? I didn't search. Not getting the right search. <laughs> um, well, the idea here. I'm not sure if you hit search. I think I did. Maybe I didn't. There we go. Um, we'll see that Bill is down here as the username, and then Koss is here as the last name. So again, it's it's splitting up the um, the search string, so you can search across first name, last name. Um, Username, I can't remember all the fields that are in there. But anyway, the, the point is now, if, if you have a first name and a last name and you want to search for it, chances are you'll get what you were looking for <laughs> rather than no results, which is what we had before. So that's a, a big improvement, hopefully, in user search when you're trying to do a search by name. That's huge. Another new feature that was added is uh, barcode checking. So we can disallow duplicate barcodes. So if I try to type in a barcode that's already in use somewhere else, you'll see a validation warning here um, that that barcode is already in use and that will prevent save. So those are some big improvements in, uh, in users. Um, another thing that happened in this release, which isn't really demoable, but is just a thing to know, is that a while back we renamed vendors to organizations because we realized a lot of organizations were not in fact vendors but we were storing tenant settings in a module called organization. So now we had organizations and organization. That was confusing. <laughs> so organization got renamed to tenant. And um, if you take a look in the settings application, you'll see that we now have tenant down here and organizations. Organizations, again, previously vendors, tenant, previously organization. So just some renaming and clarifying of stuff there. Um, on to inventory. So some things here that uh, were improved are um, keeping track of constraints. So if a holdings record has a subsidiary item record, you can't delete the holdings record. So I'm looking here at the holding record and if I try to delete this, I'll get a warning that says, hey, this has an associated item record. You can't get rid of it. So you can just cancel out of this. You can't actually go ahead with the delete. Likewise, if you go into an item record, um, you now an item record isn't going to have a subsidiary record within inventory, uh, but it could be that something's out on loan. So for example, this item is checked out, which means we have an open loan for it. And if I try to delete this, I get the same kind of warning. This item record is checked out and we can't get rid of it until there's no affiliated records elsewhere in the system. So those are two big improvements uh, in inventory. Moving on to requests, uh, there was some inconsistency in how some things were named with regard to um, fees and fines. So now if you have an open request that you want to cancel, uh, I think this used to be labeled additional information. We've just added the for patron here as well. So it's clear what that refers to. Um, and, and that will also show up, I think Darcy plans a token for that in the patron notices, which is why yeah. it was important to rename it. Yes, exactly. So we just wanted to use the same names for fields that represent the same things. Exactly. Um, finally, on um, the look at inventory, but this will actually be for checkout. Uh, this is an item that you can see has a couple of checkout notes. 
Um, it used to be that you would only see, I think, one thing at a time if you tried to check something out. We're now reporting all the notes on checkout. So if we go to check something out here and paste in this barcode, you can see we get all those notes um, on checkout. Likewise, for something that's um, multi-piece, I think. Yeah, so here's an item that has multiple pieces. If I try to check this one out, we will get, um, oops. We should get both the checkout note, and then we also get um, the multi-piece note um, as well. So there's a, a additional um, things related to checkout in terms of if there's a policy about multi-piece items, you know, not being loanable to a particular patron, a whole bunch of things related to showing multiple notes on checkout. Um, all those situations are now handled. So that is it for checkout. Back to you, Kate. Awesome. Thank you, Zach. All right. Great. Um, that means we've got eight minutes for the QA update, Anton. Yes. Thanks, everyone, for great demos and leaving me enough time to, to share QA updates so we can all get, um, get back out of this meeting on time. Can you guys see my screen? Yes. Okay. So... As usual, the link to quality dashboard is posted. If you're interested in all the details, please go there. One highlight from the dashboard, this is the list of uh, core modules that and the uh, coverage, uh, test coverage for the core modules. So we're making good progress and some modules already over 80% and few of them just hanging over the finish line. So I encourage you guys, whoever is responsible for this uh, test, just to make a little push and finish circulation calendar and check out. They practically there. And after that, we'll focus on uh, other things. So now switching to the next slide. Uh, we finished Bugfest 2.2. That was pretty much just clean up after 2.1, just making sure that we retested everything that failed. We only filed 13 bugs and um, basically there was not a lot of, uh, not a lot of uh, kind of high priority issues, issues there, but oh, as, as uh, Jakub mentioned, everything that's supposed to be fixed for 2.2 got fixed for 2.2. So now looking forward, um, so the next 3.1 release, the next few weeks will be pretty action packed. And to manage, to help us manage that, I created the um, bug tracking uh, dashboard. It called uh, Q31 um, bug tracking. Uh, you have link here and um, you can just search it in Jira. So, so just to explain what's on the dashboard, on the right hand side are bugs that are not tagged to be in 3.1 release. So this is what is not in the release. On the left side, what will be in the release? So the green table, it's features. So it's all UX prod features. Uh, and I believe it may change soon as product owners will add their um, features to this um, to this table. In order to do that, you only have you have to add Q3.1-2019 label to any uh, to any UX uh, prod ticket to do that. Same thing applies to bugs. So this is where devs should pay attention. So this is bugs that must be fit, product owner tag them uh, that they must be fixed in this release. So, uh, and then the bottom, uh, the bottom table, th those are bugs that were not tagged, but somehow they got resolved after 2.2 release. So they already 
fixed and checked in, so they already in the they already made to master, but they just don't have a label Q3.1-19, but they resolved. So based on all of this, we will build the test plan for the bug, uh, bug fest that will start on uh, uh, on July uh, on July twenty uh, on July twenty nine, and just to again reinforce the timeline, uh, I thought I would show you the visual that we are here, and the feature freeze is practically two weeks away from now. Everything needs to be bottom, uh, buttoned down three weeks from now, just three weeks from now. And we, after that, we have only three days to prep and deploy and uh, import all the data to get the breakfast system ready. So we only have two days and the weekend to get it done. And after that, we have five weeks of the breakfast. During that time, We'll be triaging bugs and expect for, uh, to hear from us. Well, I hope you will never hear from us, but in case you will, we will push bugs back to you as soon as we can, uh, can so that we don't wait until the bug fest is over. We'll try to push bugs that needs to be fixed to you as soon as we find them so you have more time to fix it. And moving on to July, after the bug fest, uh, fest is over, we have just very few days to fix something that needs to be, that we, if we find something, very few days. And then on the 8th is a go, no go, and on the 12th, we out with 3.1 that goes to Chalmers. So as you can see, it's pretty tight and no room for error so that kind of plan carefully and commit to things that you can do and raise flags early. Um, and that's pretty much all I have. So, if there are any questions? I guess not. I guess Thank you, not. Anton. I guess everything is clear. I guess everything is clear. Let's go, let's go get it. Uh, yeah, this is really exciting. Um, I have to say, I've been really blown away by the progress made by every team. Um, if you'd like to take a look at what's planned for the coming sprints, um, come into the deck. Uh, each of the POs have the plans for upcoming sprints outlined here. Um, and yeah, we'll talk again in uh, about four weeks.